Okay, this is going to be uh, the homework assignment that uh, we do from uh, chapter two about um, the second uh, story we want to tell in uh, fruit fly development. And uh, it's the one that we're going to use uh, macaroni in a drawing assignment. And so in this video, I am going to talk through the background biology, uh, the new biology uh, for us. And then uh, I'm going to have a video camera and uh, I'll do the assignment with the drawing and labeling and the glue. So um, I put supplies outside in my office again, uh, and that includes the macaroni. I had some of that out in class uh, because I hope you would never have to buy any supplies. If you have uh, the kind of art supplies needed at home, um, you can use those. Uh, otherwise, come up to my office and uh, and you can set up stuff on the tables nearby and use the uh, items uh, there. Um, and, you know, come with another student and uh, you can each do your own, uh, but you can uh, share the work as you go. Uh, but you have to do your own, you know, assignment. And then we're going to take pictures of those and email them to me. All right. So um, this is uh, what we're going to talk about. And so we have... Um, the, uh, let me just get going with this uh, pen drawing so I can draw in here as well. Sorry about this, but uh, so we have segments in uh, insects and in arthropods in general. And uh, so there's one segment and it's really clear that the body plan in the anterior posterior axis of arthropods is to set up individual sections or segments like that. And we're going to talk about the segments. The first story was to identify these segments based on differential Hox gene expression, combination of Hox gene uh, get expressed in each of the segments to give them their different features. So for example, these are the thoracic segments and they have legs. Uh, this is where the wings are going to be also on the thoracic segment. These are head, head segments uh, compressed together and then abdominal segments like that, okay? And so what this story is going to be is about a set of genes that are referred to as segment polarity genes. Our book calls them segmentation genes. Uh, I don't know. That's a very unusual term. Um, I think that seg I know that segment polarity genes is something that's used uh, very much. And they're expressed in each segment. And so this assignment, we're going to just draw one segment and it could be any of these segments. And what it is about is patterning, uh, setting up the pattern of each segment. Each segment is different, but they share a common feature of needing to establish the orientation of the segment, anterior and posterior, and then positions within the segment. And uh, what it's going to be like is there is a invisible line down the roughly down the middle of each segment. And it's an invisible light. You can't see it under a microscope, but it creates distinct cells on each side of the line. And uh, so there are going to be cells in the front part of the segment, and those are going to be called anterior compartment cells. And then they're going to be, and they're like on the same team, and then they're going to be cells uh, uh, behind that line and uh, they're going to be posterior compartment cells. So each segment is made up of a posterior compartment and an anterior compartment and the cells have different uh, identities and different characteristics and different gene expression. The line helps establish uh, sort of a reference point like imagine um, if you are building a house on a hillside so the hillside is on level, but you need to build the house level. And so what you do is you have some surveyors come and they pound in stakes and they uh, um, use surveying equipment to reference a, a level a line across the property. And then they mark that level line on the stakes. And that provides a reference uh, as the house is being built for each of the corners of the house and each of the you know, floors of the house to be level based on that reference. And that's, that's essentially what this line is like. It provides a reference, it provides a source for development to proceed around. Um, we're gonna draw a picture of this at uh, two hours after fertilization. And um, the, cause that's when this line is uh, first uh, set up. And then that line continues throughout development. 
Now, at two hours after fertilization, each segment is only four cells wide in this direction, from anterior to posterior. So see, it's going to do a lot of growing, and it's going to grow based on this uh, reference line. So it's going to expand and grow uh, over time. And so the segment polarity genes stay on, they maintain this, and the line that they're maintaining, the invisible line they're maintaining, is called a compartment boundary. So these are really nice terms, uh, anterior compartment, posterior compartment, and compartment boundary. Uh, when we look at the uh, uh, grown up arthropod, uh, it really looks like it's based on these segments, but it actually is based on these compartment boundaries that we get these discrete segments, uh, segmental units like that. <clears throat> when they're first established, it's in the very early embryo, and it's not the segments get established, it's these compartment boundaries. Uh, because of that, the original uh, fruit fly geneticists didn't call these compartment boundaries when they studied them early. They used this other term. We don't need to learn this term, but our book uses it. So instead of saying compartment boundary, our book says para-segments. So instead of segments, like I've circled, the book describes these offset para-segments where the edges of those are the compartment boundaries. We don't need to learn about that. It's confusing and it's an uncommon word. Compartment boundary is common. And although our bodies set up, human bodies set up compartments very differently than we'll learn here, uh, the story is very similar. To make an edge, and how can we make an edge where cells on either side of this are very different? The anterior cells are very different than the posterior cells. Okay? So, it fits into the story here where this is really the first story we uh, learned about and that is a cascade of gene expression starting with maternal factors and going down through zygotic uh, embryonic transcription factors to ultimately regulate expression of what our book calls selector genes and which include the Hox genes. The second story also involves a cascade of gene expression setting up the segmentation genes, or much more commonly, the segment polarity genes. And we told this story, uh, this pathway, this cascading, cascading pathway of gene expression in the first story. So let's not retell it here. Instead, let's get to the point. And the point is, let's go to the two hour after um, uh, fertilization time and simply draw a picture. And so we're going to have a picture like this that we're going to do for our assignment. And we're going to label it and uh, have some features of it, gene expression features, and glue some macaroni it to underscore a really important feature of it. So segment polarity genes from the Wikipedia page. Segment polarity genes help to define the anterior posterior polarities within each embryonic parasegment by regulating the transmission of signals via wind signaling pathway and hedgehog signaling pathway. So yay. What we're going to do is we're going to find in our drawing that we're going to recreate the Wnt signaling pathway. Here's going to be the source cell, here's going to be the target cell, and it's exactly the same as the previous assignment we had where we drew a picture of the Wnt signaling pathway for a homework assignment. In this case, the source cells are anterior compartment cells and the targets are posterior compartment cells. And the signal from the Wnt signaling pathway is going to be tell these cells to be posterior. The interesting addition to this is that also the posterior cells, in being posterior cells, they become a source cell and the anterior cells become a target cell because in turn, the posterior cells start to express hedgehog. So the hedgehog signaling pathway, which we have a little bit of familiarity with, uh, we call it sonic hedgehog, and we can go ahead and call it either hedgehog, the Drosophila name for the ortholog, or sonic hedgehog, the vertebrate name for the ortholog. But we have a hedgehog coming out, and what's hedgehog signaling do? It tells the anterior cells to be anterior. So we have this um, feedback loop, and these cells become like teams, where we have the posterior cell team and the anterior cell team, and they're essentially crossing, uh, shouting at each other across this boundary. The anterior cells are saying, be posterior, and the posterior cells are saying, be anterior. And by that, what we're doing is we're setting up a nice, crisp, and long-lived uh, boundary. 
and that allows us to have this as sort of like that surveying tool say this is the start of this region and we're gonna have these cells be different we're gonna have those cells be different and then we're gonna have signals spread out from here okay great this is just an example from the book showing that invisible line where this would be the anterior cells and these would be the posterior cells and that would be the compartment boundary and the compartment boundary is not a straight line, it's a wiggly line like that. And, um, and you can't see where it is, uh, even with a microscope. What the book is showing here is mutation, and if we have a mutation in these uh, segment polarity genes, then that compartment boundary doesn't get set up properly and we have uh, the teams kind of intermingling. Inter, uh, now, this is the wing, and it's because each wing on an insect is part of a segment as is each leg on an insect. And that um, segment polarity um, uh, gene product, that compartment boundary, it goes through each wing and each leg. So it helps set up patterning of the wings, the legs, and the body of the insect like that, okay? This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna actually have, uh, I have a document camera and this will be our compartment boundary and this will be anterior and anterior cells and these will be posterior and posterior cells. I'm going to draw on it, I'm going to label it, I'm going to talk you through it and you're going to create a comparable uh, drawing. One of the reasons I'm using macaroni is because students have a tendency to make really tiny uh, drawing assignments and we're going to glue macaroni on so you need to make uh, full-size pieces of paper like that in order to accommodate the macaroni and uh, also not to make it too big. We want it to be big uh, and that spreads out your learning and spreads out your understanding. Here's another uh, couple of sentences from the segment polarity gene Wikipedia page. It says there are five gene classes which each contribute to the segmentation and development of the embryonic Drosophila. These five gene classes include the coordinate gene, gap gene, parallel gene, segment polarity gene, and homeotic gene. And that's listing, let's see where I have it, that's listing this where it's saying, yep, there's a cascade of gene expression leading to the segment polarity genes, and it includes these genes that we learned some about in the first um, story. We're not gonna learn about them in the second story. We're just gonna go to that snapshot. Here's from our first handout. These are the genes that we're especially gonna pay attention to. Uh, I don't have gherkin, should be quite on there, circle that. So, uh, sonic hedgehog, it was originally called hedgehog and fruit flies. You can easy, use either term. I would learn sonic hedgehog. Wint, it was really called witless in fruit flies. You can use either, use either term, I'd use wint. And grailed is a new uh, protein for us. It's a transcription factor. So it's going to get expressed in posterior cells. And it's a transcription factor, so it's going to regulate gene expression. Uh, CI is a transcription factor, and that's going to be expressed in the anterior cells and it's going to help express uh, uh, genes that are part of being anterior cells. And the final one is another signaling factor called D, oop, DPP. And that's a long ring signaling factor that's actually a member of the TGF beta signaling family, super family, like that, okay? Uh, up here, Sonica, Hedgehog, and Wint, we already know their uh, signaling factors. And there are more genes that we'll mention, but this is kind of the core uh, that we'll especially focus on, all right? Um, we have a background. So we have this background where gene expression determines the identity of cells. So muscle cells have a muscle cell identity because they're expressing muscle genes. Brain cells have a brain cell, a cell identity because they're expressing brain cell genes. Uh, when we talk about those cells, they're tissues, and so they're often referred to as tissue-specific genes. There are muscle-specific genes and brain-specific genes, like that. So we have that example of how muscle genes get activated during muscle differentiation to make muscle cells. The cells have the, all the genes all the time because of general molecular equivalence, but they just express a subset and a changing subset of genes over development. Uh, we have another example of this idea of how gene expression determines the identity of the cells because earlier, before the cells were myoblast cells, they were mesoderm cells. And we learned uh, that brachiary gene expression uh, uh, occurs uh, and that contributes to mesoderm specification. And so to have a mesoderm identity, cells express brachiary and additional genes. But we have those examples, and this is just a new, this homework assignment is just a new example. 
segment polarity genes get activated in the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment of each segment in insects. So these are going to be anterior cells because they're expressing anterior genes, and these are going to be uh, posterior cells because they're pro setting, uh, expressing posterior genes like that. Uh, you could say they have a posterior identity, they have an anterior identity, it's based on the genes they, they express. And the segment polarity genes guide that, uh, of the um, acquisition of that identity. So these cells become posterior cells because they're being signaled by, through the segment polarity gene pathways, and these become anterior cells because they're being signaled by the uh, segment polarity gene um, signaling pathways, okay? This is a picture that's not from your book, and, uh, but this is what our uh, assignment is gonna look like, is we're gonna have a cell that's a posterior cell, we're gonna have a cell that's an anterior cell. Uh, this is actually staining, so this is a kind of immunohistochemistry staining it, uh, and this is a Drosophila embryo, and it's a, uh, at about that two hour stage after fertilization, and it's expressing these. And so there are these stripes, and the stripes correspond to the compartment boundaries. So here's a stripe of gene expression, here's a stripe of gene expression, and so forth. Repeated stripes of gene expression. And um, the stripes are because um, the cells are stained for gene expression of segment polarity genes. All right, and so this is what our drawing's gonna look like. The anterior cells, I've already mentioned, are source cells, and they are synthesizing Wnt and releasing it. And the posterior cells are target cells of the Wnt signaling pathway. So there is a, a Wnt gene in the source cell, and it's being expressed. So part of being anterior involves uh, transcription factors that activate the Wnt gene and Wnt expression, and they secrete that signal. And the signal is essentially saying, be a posterior cell. The, the Wnt binds to the frizzle receptor, and through that disheveled and GSK and uh, beta-catenin pathway, we stabilize beta-catenin, and it over, is a transcription factor that overcomes TCF repression and activates genes in the posterior, and these would be posterior identity genes. And we're gonna have a list of posterior identity genes that we wanna learn about that will have listed right on our drawing assignment. And uh, so if you think about it, expressing this frizzled receptor, it's a protein, and there must be a frizzled gene, Expressing that is part of being posterior. So the very first gene that's gonna be on our list of posterior identity genes is frizzled, because you need to express frizzle to receive the signal, hey, be posterior, like that. So it has to be expressed, like that. And uh, disheveled is a protein, um, uh, GSK3 is a protein, and uh, this is the, um, beta-catenin in fruit flies, and we do not need to learn the fruit fly names. The fruit fly name is a silly name. It's called armadillo. The ortholog of beta-catenin in fruit flies is called armadillo, but please don't worry about the details of names like that, okay? Um, and so expressing all these genes is going to be part of being posterior. Does the anterior cell express frizzle? Well, it has the gene, it has the frizzle gene, but of course it does not have the appropriate transcription factor. So it doesn't express frizzle, it doesn't receive the Wintless signal, and so it's not a posterior cell. So that brings up another thing, and that is that um, this transcription factor must be expressed in the posterior cell, but not the anterior cell. So that's gonna be another one of our posterior identity genes, okay? So our book has lousy image of this. This is the same image of it, and unfortunately, uh, this um, uh, um, figure is just not good. And uh, so that's too bad, um, but uh, that's actually one reason why we're doing this assignment is to get a good understanding of it, because our book does a very good a job explaining it, but it's complicated when you explain it in words and not well in a figure. Now, when signaling 
is something that we've seen before. So this is when Wnt is absent, and we know the beta catena transcription factor is being expressed, but it gets degraded. And then when Wnt is present, its effect is to stabilize the beta catena. So that's that. It's, we're talking about that signaling pathway. Remember, it's the typical or canonical Wnt signaling pathway that's found in every animal. Then we don't know this signaling as well, but this is the, um, the uh, hedgehog signaling pathway. So no hedgehog and plus hedgehog. And hedgehog binds to patch, and then patch helps activate uh, transcription factor, which in this case in fruit flies is called CI, and CI is expressed. And this would be happening in the anterior cells. So we have that Wnt signaling pathway activated in posterior with stabilizing the beta catena transcription factor, activating a set of posterior identity genes, and the uh, CI transcription factor active in the anterior, expressing uh, activating expression of anterior identity genes. Notice one of them is Wnt, because we've already said you got to make Wnt in the anterior. So this is good. All right. So there's that figure again. That's where we're going to draw. This is another image from the book, and it's a little bit confusing, but it's at just before this two-hour period, and it's showing the parasegment boundaries. These are the compartment boundaries. So here's one um, group of cells, and um, this is showing their compartment boundaries. So they originally set up compartment boundaries like this, and they're referred to in the book as parasegment boundaries because that's what they were originally called when studied in um, fruit by fruit fly genesis. You can see here, these are the ventral compartment boundaries. So if we just circle one, I'm sorry, so they are the ventral segment boundaries. So if we just circle one segment and take a look at that, right, just that one segment, and it's, this is just repeated over and over again. There are three or four or five segments on this figure. So here's one segment, and you can see the compartment boundary goes through the segment. It actually doesn't go through exactly the middle of the segment. We have at the start three uh, of the cells that are going to be in the anterior compartment and one in the posterior. But all these cells divide, and they end up being pretty equal-sized um, compartments in the older animals like that. So that's what we're looking at, and this is just showing uh, examples of expression. So we see that the Wnt signaling factor is expressed in the anterior. We see that the patched signaling factor is expressed Oh, patch is expressed in the anterior also because that's the receptor. Uh, we see that the uh, hedgehog is expressed in the posterior. So the hedgehog gets released and binds to patch and activates genes like windless, so wingless or wind. So we have again that feedback loop of wind signaling posterior and hedgehog signaling anterior, and in the process, uh, um, activating the corresponding genes in this pathway. What that's going to be like is just an ongoing shouting match, but when we activate genes, we can activate several genes. And so there are several posterior identity genes that create the, uh, the posterior identity. There are several genes that are expressed, that express the anterior. So a C is part of this feedback loop when it includes gene expression. We don't need to just express the genes that are in the feedback loop, like hedgehog. We can also express a variety of the genes. Great. Okay, so now I'm going to cut over here, and this is this document camera I have that works like this, and uh, I'm just going to do the assignment. So this is where you would start your assignment, and I got two pieces of paper, and I use construction paper just to show you uh, the look of it. And uh, so what we're going to have is we're going to have uh, our anterior cells here and our posterior cells here. That means that this is the posterior, uh, is the compartment boundary. So that's going to be our most important line. That's the compartment boundary. And it's a signaling assignment. So we're going to draw a source cell like this. Pretty big, like that. And that's going to be in the anterior. And we're going to draw a source cell like this. And that's going to be in the posterior. There are going to be additional cells in the posterior, right, like this. There are going to be additional cells in the anterior like this. We're just going to focus our drawing especially on one cell, but they're all doing the same thing. Okay? And uh, so we can start out with uh, Wnt. And uh, we can start our uh, little story with Wnt, and we can say, here's Wnt, and uh, there's the Wnt gene in the, uh, in the anterior cell, and uh, the Wnt gene is being activated. Uh, because there must be a transcription factor here. 
and uh, that transcription factor is expressed in the anterior, but not in the posterior. Uh, there's a Wnt gene down here, but it's not being activated because the transcription factor is not present, not active. Okay, so that's going to make Wnt protein, and uh, I should have made this a different color. Let me just doctor this up a little bit to show this transcription is a different protein like that. Okay, all right, so we're going to have Wnt coming out of here and floating like this, and that's our Wnt signaling pathway that uh, starts with Wnt and then binds to frizzle. So we want to make some frizzle in this posterior compartment cell like that, and we want to label that frizzle. So that's the frizzled receptor, and we can have some Wnt binding to it like that. Okay. And I don't have great penmanship, but I hope that makes you feel good if you're kind of sloppy like I am, and uh, uh, your artwork doesn't look have to look perfect. It just needs to be functional. Now, this cell must have frizzle. And there must be a transcription factor that's binding there that's activating this frizzle. And um, so there's the frizzle gene. And just as a reminder, of course, this cell also has frizzle. And it's not being expressed. It's not being expressed because it's not a posterior cell. So frizzle is a posterior identity gene. Uh, there would be no transcription factor bound here. Um, and it would be bound back here because the transcription factor is not active, not expressed in these cells, okay? So we're eventually going to start writing down a list on this same handout, and it's going to be a list of examples of some posterior compartment cells, uh, gene, uh, genes that are being expressed. And you could also call those posterior identity genes, like that. They're expressed in the posterior. They're present, of course, in the anterior because of genomic equivalence, but those cells are not expressed here. Instead, there are anterior compartment cells. And we're just going to mention a couple of them. Uh, they really are complementary, like we've already seen that Wnt is an anterior compartment cell, and its comparable uh, gene in the posterior is going to be hedgehog. And uh, we're not going to try to write down all of those identity genes for the anterior uh, just because we don't want to confuse this list. So we're going to focus on this, but we're going to mention some genes, like we already mentioned Wnt here. We're going to mention some of the genes in the anterior, but the, we won't try to make that list here. We won't be trying to make it as, uh, as uh, full. Now, let's just start making the list. So the first one we want to say is frizzled. Frizzled is an essential posterior compartment gene, uh, and it has to be expressed for cells to become posterior, like that, okay? All right, so the next thing is that um, these cells are going to release hedgehog, or sonic hedgehog. And so we've got sonic hedgehog being made in the posterior and floating away, and it's going to bind to the anterior cells. And uh, I'll just call this hedgehog, but sonic hedgehog, like that. And it's going to bind to uh, the, its receptor patched. So patched is the complementary um, um, protein to frizzle. Uh, so it's an anterior compartment cell uh, gene, and we would just might as well just make that up here. We'll just call it patched is up here, right? Makes sense. So the genes are in all the cells, but only uh, posterior cells expressed frizzle, only anterior cells expressed uh, patched. And this uh, cell must have a hedgehog gene. Boop. And uh, there must be a transcription factor that binds to it and activates it. And so our second example of a posterior compartment or a posterior identity gene is hedgehog. So you got to receive the posterior signal, but it's also really important for you to produce the signal that stimulates the anterior cells because they're the ones that stimulated you. See, you wouldn't be a posterior cell if you didn't have frizzle. You also wouldn't be a posterior cell if you didn't have Wnt. So you're dependent on this to make Wnt. And it, gets, it makes Wnt in response to the hedgehog signal. So that's quite possible that this is the transcription vector CI. Okay. It's quite possible that this is the uh, transcription vector beta-catenin. I say quite possible because on our next example, 
we're going to include another gene that's expressed in the posterior, and it's a gene that's called engrailed. And engrailed is a transcription factor. And engrailed is a transcription factor. That means that it's going to be expressed, and it's going to help activate posterior genes. In fact, I don't know if it's beta-catenin or engrailed that activates frizzled and hedgehog. It's one or the other, and there are actually more transcription factors. We saw that effect with the muscle differentiation. MyoD is a transcription factor. Myogenin is also a transcription factor. And so when uh, cells start to have specific identity, they express a variety of transcription factors that are going to activate the appropriate genes. So we learned that myogenin activates the muscle genes like that. MyoD also actually helps with that. And there are other transcription factors that are activated in muscle differentiation that help with that. So that's what's going on here. And so we're just using this to make sure students understand that it's not all dependent on beta-catenin like that. Okay? And uh, so on we go. And uh, oh, and so we could do this up here where, you know, just I said I wasn't going to do this, but we might also do some of it. So this would be the corresponding gene. And then the one we learned here is that CI transcription factor. So these are genes that are posterior identity genes, uh, uh, anterior identity genes, posterior identity genes. Okay. So next one is the one where we get to use the macaroni because, and this is new knowledge, and it's really fascinating, uh, the next one are a set of genes that are called cell adhesion, whoop, adhesion molecules. And they are proteins, and the proteins get expressed on the cell surface. So we're going to have uh, some cell adhesion molecules here, and they're going to be transcription factors, maybe beta-catenin, maybe engrailed, maybe something else that activates these cell adhesion molecules. Okay? And here's what they do. And so now I get to glue on some macaroni. And I'm actually going to use double macaroni because the surface of all these cells is covered with macaroni of a specific kind. So you can just go like this and just glue this on like this to your awesome assignment. You're doing great. I'm messing up your list like that. Okay? And what we're going to do is these cell adhesion molecules are all like elbow macaroni. And the reason that's significant is because cell adhesion molecules stick together. They like our little hands and these cells are holding hands just like a team of kids in grade school where you say, okay, you guys are going to be a team. You should all hold hands. And they do that and you can see this becomes a really critical aspect of the cell biology of, of um, the compartments. The posterior compartments uh, cells and the anterior compartment cells never mix together. Why not? Because they are two different teams with two different kinds of hands. So we're going to see the anterior cells express cell adhesion molecules as well, but they are going to be made up of shell macaroni noodles. Oh yeah. So I'm doing a good job getting these all together and I did a good job with little drops of glue because I knew what I was heading to because I want to make it show, demonstrate that these macaronis on the surface of the cell, so they're extracellular proteins like that, uh, transmembrane proteins with extracellular domains, and they are holding hands like that. And they'll do that for the lifetime of the organism. And that happens in us too. It happens in all animals that there are, in general, cell adhesion molecules on the surface of every cell in an animal, any animal. And uh, their job is, uh, their main job is to make connections with other cells. That's one of the reasons why um, our tissues stick together. 
Uh, the biggest reason for us is these cell adhesion molecules play really important roles in our drug game uh, development. And they're covered in Chapter 7. And we're going to get to Chapter 7 really soon uh, in our class. And a uh, big part of that will be to learn more about um, <coughs> cell adhesion molecules. So I'm just going to finish my awesome assignment uh, by gluing uh, some shell noodles on here. I didn't put any out here, but I should have because there are cell adhesion molecules all around the cell. And you can see that this invisible boundary has a boundary because there are no, the cells don't hold hands in between the anterior and the posterior compartment. Okay? We have to say a couple more things after I get this glue on here. We have to add a couple more things to our list. And uh, the one we can add right now before I add, glue these on is we can just write down here is that there are going to be different cell adhesion molecules up here. These are going to make a kind of shell noodle cell adhesion uh, molecules. These uh, uh, molecules are proteins, so they have genes, and there are gene families, and uh, there are some big gene families in animals because they play such an important part in our development and also our physiology. Like I said, they help keep our tissues together as adults. And even sponges, uh, I don't think sponges are animals. If they are, there are very distantly related uh, relatives. And even sponges have these cell adhesion molecules. Sponges are diploblasts, two layers, and the two layers express different types of cell adhesion molecules. So you can actually take a, a sponge and you can use uh, enzymes to uh, degrade the cell adhesion molecules so the sponge falls apart. And then overnight, you can let those cells mix together. And what happens is the cell adhesion molecules get synthesized again and the cells start holding hands and the sponge actually reassembles in the night, overnight, over time, because the sticky hands hold with each other and the cells just naturally sort it out. And we'll see in chapter seven that that same type of stuff happens in our bodies as well. So again, I should have put some uh, elbow noodle noodles down here and to show that they are different and are not gonna be holding hands. I was gonna do a good job. I was gonna do a great job and have all the shells down like this. I wanna do this shells because they look like little hedgehogs, and they're not hedgehogs, but they get activated by hedgehog signaling, right? So that's kind of cute. And uh, hopefully your drawing looks a little better than mine. Okay, so that, 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 that. And um, then I just want to add a couple more items to the list. And they are that we want to say that on our list that there are other there are lots of other other posterior compartment genes and there are lots of other anterior compartment genes we're going to add another to the um, anterior compartment because it was on our original handout list and it's this DPP a secreted signaling factor called DPP and DPP is referred to as a long-range signaling factor. The hedgehog and wit just act here right at the boundary, uh, just over a few cells like that. And once it gets established right at the boundary, that's where this, um, uh, the segment starts to grow. And so the cells that are growing get established to be, yeah, your anterior. And once you're back here, yeah, you're anterior. So you don't need to receive the local signals anymore. You're set. Uh, DPP is a long-range signaling factor. So it's made here along this line. It's made by the anterior cells on a stripe along the line. And it spreads out longer distances. So as the segment gets bigger, this DPP can be like that survey of the foundation. And it could spread out longer distances. So you could say, now it's time to make the second floor of our house. We're going to make sure that's level. We're going to use this as the boundary or the level, and we're going to have that DPP signal spread way out here to help guide the proper development of the more anterior 
parts of the of the boundary and the most pure posterior parts of the parts of the boundary. One thing that happens is way out here at the edges where there is no DPP signal, guess what gets made here? The segments, edges, the segment boundaries. <coughs> that distinct observable edge of the segment is made because there's no DPP signaling there or there. <coughs> and there's none from this compartment boundary, and there's none, right? There's another compartment boundary up there, the compartment boundary down there. So the segments in arthropods start to form because there's places or stripes where there's no DPP signaling. It doesn't reach that far. Awesome. All right, so on we go, um, and that's that assignment. So do this assignment, then take pics and send me pics uh, like that. Uh, great. All right, thanks a lot.